Okay, everybody, welcome to our 11. I say one, but it's our 11. And if you need the notes, uh, they're always at that spot. But I found out from Krista that I forgot to put something up, and she's going to remind me to, to put that up. But uh, it's time to pray. Before I pray, do you know where every single one of your prayers every day of your life have gone? Do you know where they've gone? Revelation 5 and Revelation 8 say that in front of the throne of God, there's a bowl, and every prayer you've ever prayed, God collects. And uh, a lot of people collect a lot of things. God collects prayers. Every prayer you've ever prayed, God either says yes, no, or wait. But he keeps every one of them. So that means he likes us to pray. And let's do that now. Okay. Father in heaven, I thank you for these precious students. Thank you for this time in their life when they are so able to learn. And I pray that you would fill their hearts with a hunger to grow more and more in knowing you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, I'm still the same person I was last week, but in case you forgot, and that's my wonderful <laughs> wife, my wonderful family. Bonnie and I are missionaries. We serve in Africa and Asia and here in Europe. I would, I would love to become your friend on Facebook. Uh, uh, my normal page is just John Samuel Barnett. The counseling page is another one on Facebook. On YouTube, uh, this course and everything else I've ever taught is on YouTube. And that's our uh, central website. It's called dtbmdiscoverthebook.org. Uh, Amazon distributes uh, all 36 of the books that I've written, and they're electronic and video and audio and paper. There is no difference between what you do in this class and what you do on the streets when you're sharing the gospel and what you do for the rest of your life reaching some lost tribe in some Amazon jungle. It is all equally an offering to the Lord. In fact, Paul told the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 10.31 that whether you eat or drink or anything else you do in life, you do it for the glory of God. And so basically God is saying there's no difference in life between the sacred things and the plain old secular things you do in life, all of them are supposed to be done for the glory of God. And once we understand that, we can become like the early church. Most of the early church were slaves, and they had to do stuff they did not want to do for a master that was very mean to them. So when they heard the gospel, that they could serve that pagan, ungodly, wicked master and do it for God, it changed their whole life. And that's what we're going to see when we look at the rewards in the throne of God here in Revelation. Revelation is the most vital, significant, crucial, strategic, and explanatory book of the Bible. Explanatory is an English word that means connecting something to life. In fact, the preaching of the gospel is taking someone from today back to the time of the Bible and showing them a truth. So alive in 2018, transported back 2,000 plus years to see a truth, but not left 2,000 years ago in the Bible world, but transported back to understand how to apply that truth today. When we only learn truth and truth and truth and truth and truth and never apply it, it just makes us get proud with all we know. But when we honestly apply the word of God to our hearts, it humbles us. Now, do you remember I started out the class with my little box of puzzle pieces and I passed them out to you? It's not just revelation that's important. The whole Bible is important to God. But what's amazing is Revelation connects all the parts of the Bible and completes everything that God started in Genesis. In fact, Genesis and Revelation are the bookends of the Bible. And everything that God starts in Genesis, we find completed in Revelation. 
The other 64 books of the Bible are completely tied together by seeing what God started and by seeing what God finishes. And so the more we feel each time we read the Bible, the weight of everything else that God has said, the more we understand each verse in the context of the whole Bible. I tell young people your age that this is a great time to start a lifelong study of the Bible. Every one of you have favorite topics in the Bible. Uh, some of you are really into like marriage or evangelism or missions. And some of you are into prophecy or the names of God or some other topic. When I was trained to study the Bible, I was trained to take one topic at a time and to read all the way through the Bible, which only takes 72 hours. I would say that many of you probably listen to more than 72 hours of music a month. And I know that most American young people in American schools, even Christian schools, probably spend, at least the boys do, 72 hours playing games. And others spend that much time on watching movies. And others spend that much time updating all of their social media. In heaven forever, will God ask you about all the music you listen to and give you a crown for listening to music? Is there a gaming crown? Is there a watching movies crown in heaven? Is there the king or queen of social media crown in heaven? When I was at Dallas Seminary, where Dr. Pond is from, I remember Howard Hendricks telling us that many Christians are going to get to heaven, bump into Habakkuk, and say, what's your name? And he'll say, Habakkuk. And they'll say, who were you? And Habakkuk will say, I wrote a book in the Bible that only takes 72 hours for a sixth grader to read out loud. To read the Bible out loud in the sixth grade takes 72 hours. Each one of you here, at the minimum, are in the 13th grade. You're in post high school education. So you're at least one year out. And some of you, who knows, you've already gone to college. And Habakkuk will say, uh, what did you do with all the 72 hours you had? And you say, oh, music, game, movies. I posted everything I ever ate and sent pictures of it to everybody in the world. And I didn't spend time to read the whole Bible and find that there are over 400 different names, titles, and ascriptions to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in the Bible. Different names. And I never read every one of the 1,189 chapters of the Bible to see that God is a Savior and wants to save the world. And I never studied myself how Jesus and the apostles and the early church shared the gospel. I would argue over whether, you know, Ray Comfort's way is best or, you know, D. James Kennedy's way is best or Campus Crusade is best, but I never studied what God said was the best way to share the gospel. And even though most young people are obsessed or scared to death of marriage, they've never seen God's plan for marriage. Bonnie and I were... Uh, Oh, by the way, I'll, I'll make a slide of that. It only takes 72 hours to read the whole Bible. Now, here's a, a study question for your next quiz and your final exam. Without looking at the screen, how long does it take to read the whole Bible? Say it out loud. Whoa. I spent one whole month reading the Bible from cover to cover and looking at everything God said about marriage and everyone that was married. And then I began to study what the roles of the husband and the roles of the wife are from all those verses. And I'll tell you a little secret. If you've studied what the Bible says about marriage, it's very interesting. If you want to serve God like Paul 100% of the time, don't get married. Because the Bible says if you get married, your highest calling in life 
is to that person that you are married to. Ministry becomes number two. Your marriage becomes number one. Paul said, if you want to be like me and never be hindered in ministry, don't you dare get married. But he told the Corinthians, you're not called to be like me. You should get married, and after you love your wife and your husband as Christ and the church love each other, then you serve me. Do you know what happens when you are married and try and put ministry first? It harms your children and it harms your testimony. Bonnie and I were invited to go to Mexico City in Mexico, and a foundation in America paid our way to fly there to meet with 250 church planters. And those church planters worked in the slums, they worked in the villages, they worked in, in little places that had no roads going to them, just paths for the animals to walk on. And the church planters had worked 10 years, 20 years, some of them 40 years starting churches in Mexico. But the mission they all worked for found out that most of their children were not Christians. In Deuteronomy 6, God says that if you're married and have a family, you're supposed to talk about God when you get up in the morning, when you sit at your meals, when you go through the day, and at night. And for 10 and 20 and 40 years, as soon as they got up, they left, and they went and led people to the Lord all over the world, and at night they came back into the house tired, and they hardly saw their children or their husband or wife because all they were doing is serving in their villages. So they, they paid for us two to go and tell these unbelievable, powerful servants of the Lord that they were neglecting their families. The clearest teaching in the Bible about marriage is in Ephesians 5. And in Ephesians 5, it says that a husband is supposed to be like Jesus Christ, and a wife is supposed to be like the church, and that their marriage is supposed to be a reflection of Christ and his church. And so if you're married, everywhere you go, people see a reflection of Christ. And so, I just had all of the couples in the conference stand up and face one another and repeat what Ephesians 5 said they were supposed to be. And the translator that was working with me, he said, you want them to stand up right now? I said, mm-hmm. He said, you, you want them to face each other and say these things? I said, mm-hmm. And he came over to me, covered his mic, and he said, Mexican men don't say things like that out loud to their wives. It's embarrassing for them to say that they love and want to serve and they adore and want to cherish their wife out loud. The first statement is, I want to love you as Christ loves his church. And when I said, say that out loud to your wife, the translator said, are you sure? Could you tell I was getting a little resistance here from the translator? And so the men finally started, and they, they turned, they held their wife's hands, they looked him in the eye, and they said, I want to love you like Christ loves his church. So there were 250 couples facing each other like this. <laughs> And after the little murmur of them saying that to each other went by, I watched, and the lights that were shining down on them were reflecting off these little rivers of sparkling tears running down many of the wives' faces. Bonnie and I spent an entire week teaching and mentoring them from Ephesians 5 and Titus 2. And as Bonnie was teaching the women, they would keep pushing her table and pushing her backward for about two hours. They kept pushing her back, and she couldn't figure out why until finally one of them told her that they didn't have electricity, and the light coming in the window was what she needed to keep going, and they wanted her to not stop. They didn't realize that the most vivid display 
of Christ's love for his church was designed by God to be through the marriage between a godly man and a godly woman. That's why we have so much in the Bible detail about creation and the Garden of Eden and the design of marriage by God. Because the Bible, from Genesis 3 all the way through to Revelation 5, is about how God wants to redeem us and save us and change us. Did you know in heaven God will not judge any believer on how their children turned out or how their marriage turned out? We have to answer to God as believers, number one, for how we reflected Christ in our marriage, if we're married, and whether or not we raised our children the way the Bible says. Not whether the children turn out, it's how we raised them. God raised Israel correctly, they didn't turn out very well. It's not God's fault that Israel rebelled, it's their own fault. We're responsible for how we reflect Christ as a husband or wife in marriage and how we reflected Christ as a mother or father in our family. And it's all based on the the three big questions. Where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? And if I have a creator, he's told me what he expects. And if I have a redeemer, he's given me the power to do what he expects me to do as a husband, wife, and mother and father. And someday I'm going to stand in front of him and answer for whether I was obedient or not. Now Jesus said something very interesting just before the cross. He said, the purpose of the Holy Spirit is that he, the Holy Spirit, shall glorify me, John 16, 14. Basically, we could outline the Bible that the Old Testament is showing Christ coming, and the Gospels are about Christ came here in history and lived and died, And the book of Acts is all about that Christ is alive and he's living inside of us, his church. And if we live out Christ's love to the world in our family and in our marriage, the world can't believe it. They've never seen anything like that. And the epistles are all about how Jesus is constantly changing us more every day of our life to be like Christ. And Revelation says he's coming back and he's going to finish everything. Now what's interesting is the Bible gives us the only correct panorama of history. And Genesis tells us that God created everything from nothing and that he designed everything we see. And God says that Revelation takes us right to the end of what history will be. So basically, the center of the Bible is that Jesus Christ is coming back. There are 1,845 verses in the Old Testament that say Jesus is coming back. There are 318 verses that say Jesus is coming back in the New Testament. And for every verse that talked about Christ's first coming, there are eight verses talking about his second coming. The clearest description of the end times is actually in the Old Testament. And the book of Revelation is built around Daniel 9's framework. And I'm not teaching the book of Daniel, but the more you understand that, the better you understand biblical prophecy. And all of the teaching you've heard about the tribulation, the midpoint of the tribulation, and the seven-year tribulation, all comes from Daniel's framework. Now, I've already given this to you in the first week that John wrote Revelation. It's about Jesus Christ unveiled, and that it follows an outline within the book. But the biggest part of Revelation is that it pictures God's plan for us. And as you know, a picture is so much clearer than a lot of words. So I've already told you this outline that all of you have learned and are really going to know for your quiz and for your test. And there's a picture that's worth a thousand words.